From the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, we present Let the Bible Speak. It's good to have you join us today as we spend time around the Word of God, preaching Christ in all his fullness to men and women in all their need. bow together in a word of prayer, please. Our eternal God, our gracious and our loving Father in heaven, we come into thy presence this evening in the precious and holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that thou art God, and there is no other God beside thee. We thank thee that thou art the designer God and the creator God, and the preserving God. And Lord, we bless thee tonight that we, sinful man, have this great means of approach unto thy presence and before thy face. We come unto thee, O God, through the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we bless thee tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee, O God, that he has come to this earth that he went all the way to the cross to reconcile sinners to a just and a holy and a righteous God. And we thank thee, O God, that he by his death and by his resurrection and by his ascension has opened up the way for men and women to come before the Lord. And in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus, we approach thee this evening hour. We bless thee, O God, that thou art a God who looks upon humanity with love and with care. For God, in his grace and in his mercy, and out of love to mankind, hath provided a Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. Grant that the Lord Jesus will be exalted tonight in the preaching of the Word, in everything that takes part in this service. 
May the Lord's blessed name be glorified. May we know the speaking voice of the Almighty to our hearts. And, O God, we ask that in all our ways we shall acknowledge Thee, and the Lord shall direct our paths. So bless this service and our coming together in Jesus' holy and worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll read God's Word from John's Gospel, chapter 3, commencing at verse 1, reading as far as verse 7, and then verses 14 to 17. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. And verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. And may the Lord bless the reading of the inspired scriptures to all of our hearts for Jesus' sake. We're going to worship the Lord again in the singing of the hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins.
We'll find our text tonight in John chapter 3, in the familiar words of verse number 16. And if there were ever words that I would love to be able to declare before the whole world, they are the words that are found in this wonderful, eternal text of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is my conviction tonight that these are the greatest words that have ever been recorded. They were spoken by the greatest man that ever lived. And they were spoken with the view to meet the greatest need of the human heart. And they are recorded for us tonight in the greatest book that was ever written. These 25 words, I believe, summarize the message of the entire Bible. They are the most concise statement that concerns God's whole plan of redemption. John chapter 3 verse 16 is responsible under God for reaching perhaps more souls than any other text of Scripture. And I believe that this text speaks to us of God's great gospel. And there are a few things that I want to leave with you tonight from this wonderful text of Scripture. And the first thing is very simply this, the great origin of the gospel. The first two words of the verse say, for God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The gospel, like creation itself, begins with God. And there are many people in our world today that profess that they don't believe in God. They doubt that there's a God. Some of them, some even try to say that they deny that there's a God, but the scripture says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And for a person to try to say that there's no God, they have to deny the great plan of creation. The scripture says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word of God reminds us that all things were created by him. And without him was nothing made that was made. You also have to deny the presence of conscience to say that there's no God. Every single one of us in this world have some sort of sense of right or wrong. The book of Romans tells us that God has written his law, his moral law upon the conscience of every individual. And for a person to say that there's no God, they're having to deny the very presence of conscience. To say that there's no God, you have to deny the person of Christ. The Savior asked that tremendous question, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And this is a question that can only be answered whenever we think about God. Because Jesus Christ did things that only God could have done. The Bible says that he was God manifest in the flesh. And then we also believe that there's a God because of the power of the cross. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. He died upon a cross, and that's a historical fact. But tonight, he's alive forevermore. And the cross work of Jesus Christ has the power to change lives and homes and hearts and families and give people a reason for living and a hope in dying and an assurance of heaven itself. Take God out of the equation, and we have no purpose for living. We've got no hope while we're living. And we've got no sure and certain destiny at the end of life's journey. The Bible says that every single one of us shall give an account of himself to God. But the gospel or the good news is that there's a way whereby our sins can be forgiven. And we can be saved and delivered and redeemed and brought to God. And so the gospel begins with God, the great origin of the gospel for God. Notice as well the great wonder of the gospel because it goes on to say, for God so loved the world. And that's the great wonder of the gospel. You know, God is many things. God is almighty. God is all-knowing. God is holy. God is righteous and God is just. But God is love. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. But this is the dearest, that Jesus loves me. Could we, we think, the ocean fill? Were the skies of parchment made? 
Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The great mystery and the great wonder of it all is that God so loved this world, this world that is full of sin and vice and wickedness and rebellion against God and departure from God, God declares in his word that he loves this world. He loves sinners. He loves people like me. And he loves people like you. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The word of God talks about the great love wherewith he have loved us. The scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that even we should be called the sons of God. And God's love is not because of anything in us. Rather, God loves us because of what's found in the very heart of God. God is love. A theologian was once asked the question, in all your years of study and in all your years of uh, expounding the Word of God and teaching others, what is the greatest truth that you have discovered in your lifetime of the study of the Bible? He says, the greatest discovery I've ever made was that discovery that I made at my mother's knee, that Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. I wonder tonight, do you doubt the love of God? I want to tell you tonight that God loves you, and he'll love you to the very gates of hell itself. There's the wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder of sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonder that fills my heart is the wonder that Jesus loves me. Notice as well in this text of Scripture, the great grace of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not only does God declare his love towards fallen man, but he also demonstrates it as well. He demonstrates his love. He doesn't demonstrate his love by alleviating human suffering. If God was to do that and leave us as we are, that would be like just unplugging a warning light in the car or turning off a fire alarm just to give us peace and relaxation. But God demonstrates his love toward us, the Bible says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, his co-equal, co-eternal, only begotten, well-beloved son, and the Bible says that God became a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. It's something we can hardly even begin to conceive or understand in our hearts and minds. But great is the mystery of godliness because God was manifest in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Scripture says he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And yet all the while he was born of a virgin... He was born without sin, and he lived a life that was sinless. The Bible says he did no sin. The Bible says he knew no sin. The Bible says he was without sin. And the Bible says that in him was no sin. And yet this sinless Son of God went all the way to a cross over 2,000 years ago. And on that cross, hanging between God's heaven and God's earth, with arms stretched wide, he shed his precious blood, to redeem a people unto himself. He became a savior and he became a redeemer. I wonder, are you saved tonight? Are you redeemed? You maybe say tonight, well, why did God have to become a man? Why did he have to live that life? Why did he have to go to a cross? It's very simple. There was none other good enough to pay the price for our sin. Jesus only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. If God had taken down the pearly gates and tore down the jasper walls and dug up the golden streets and tore down the ivory palaces and got all of the angels around his feet, it still wouldn't have been enough to redeem a sinner. Salvation is of the Lord. God can save and God alone. And so God became a man. And on that cross, suffering so much at the hands of men, the Bible says that Christ Jesus became a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. He took our sins and our sorrows, and he made them all his very own. And he bore that burden in Calvary when he suffered and died alone. The scripture tells us 700 years before he died in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord, Jehovah, hath laid upon him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. And it's like this black Bible represents my sin. And it's all upon my shoulders. It's my sin. It's my guilt. It's my shame. And by this wonderful act of love and substitution and sacrifice, the Son of God took all of my sin and purged it away by the sacrifice of himself. Friends, it's the great grace of the gospel. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But in God's great gospel, I also see, praise God, the great simplicity of the gospel, because our text goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life, but whosoever believeth on him. I believe tonight that every time the gospel is preached, every time the word of God is opened, every time someone is confronted with the claims of Jesus Christ, I believe it always demands a response. And you can either receive him or you can reject him. And the word of God calls us to believe. And that word believe there, it literally means to trust, faith, is the thing that lays hold upon this wonderful Savior. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's exactly what faith is. And it's simply beautiful. And yet at the same time, it's beautifully simple. It's not about works. It's not about religion. It's not about creed. It's not about denomination. It's not about trying to reform your life and turn over a new leaf. It's about faith in a Savior. The Philippian jailer was told, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Paul said in the book of Romans, for if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now some people believe of Jesus. They believe the historical record that there was a man called Jesus from Nazareth who was a carpenter's son and he, he died upon the cross and they believe that. And then there's others who believe a lot of things about Jesus. They believe in his virgin birth. They believe in his deity. They believe in his humanity. They believe in his sinless life. They believe that he died on a cross and rose again. They believe of him and they believe about him. But there are many in our world tonight, and maybe you're one of them, and you're not willing to believe in him and believe upon him. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are you willing by an act of faith, to repent of your sin and to confess it before God and to turn from it and to embrace this wonderful Savior that God sent to be the Savior of the world? Are you willing to trust him with your soul? Are you willing to trust him with your life? Are you willing to trust him with all of your tomorrows? Are you willing to trust him with your eternity? I'm reminded of a tightrope walker. I think his name was Blondin. And he directed this tightrope, I think it was across the Niagara Falls from America to Canada. And all of the crowd had gathered around and he walked across the tightrope and stood at the other side and came back again. And the crowd were amazed at the confidence and the ease that this man could do this. And then he spoke to a little boy in the crowd and said, do you believe that I could lift you and set you on my shoulders and carry you across the crevice to the other side safely? And the little boy said, of course, I believe you could do it. And then he held out his hands and he says, well, very well then, jump up. And of course, the little boy wasn't willing to trust with his heart. He believed in his head, but he wasn't willing to trust with his heart. And that might be your problem as well. You're not willing to trust Christ with your heart. You believe that he's the only Savior, but you yourself haven't trusted him. Notice as well the great necessity of the gospel. Three simple words, should not perish. Our text warns us here of danger. And whenever the Savior was on this earth in the days of his flesh, he warned the religious crowd, the doctors of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He says, you shall die in your sins. 
in John's Gospel, chapter 8. And nobody likes to think about the consequences of living without Christ and dying without Christ and going out into eternity without the reality of the gospel in our hearts. Everybody seems to get buried like a Christian. And yet Jesus Christ, more than any other preacher in the Bible before him or after him, spoke more about hell, eternity, judgment, and death than any other preacher. In fact, for every sermon he preached on heaven, on average he preached 13 sermons on hell. The scripture says, because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with a stroke and a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Because there's an eternity, because there's a day of judgment, because there's a hell, because there's a lake of fire, there is the necessity for the gospel. You must be saved from sin's power from sin's penalty, from sin's pollution, and praise God someday from sin's presence because hell has got no exits. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then our text concludes with the great benefit of the gospel, everlasting life. You know, scientists are ever on a quest to try to prolong life and preserve life. And it's a futile battle, it's a futile quest, because the Scripture tells us we must all needs die. And it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. But on the cross, Jesus Christ defeated sin and death and hell, and he promises spiritual life, abundant life and eternal life for anyone who will come and trust in him. Eternal life and glory. Will you receive him at this time? Trust him with your heart and to forgive you and to cleanse you and to make you a new creature. Rabbi Duncan used to say to his students, whenever they said to him at the beginning of a new year, happy new year, sir, he would turn around and say, and a happy eternity to you, gentlemen. And may God give you a happy eternity as you find the grace to trust in this wonderful Savior. Come to him. Give him your heart and your life. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Father, write thy word upon every heart. May every hero, God, respond in their hearts and come to Christ. We ask these things for thine eternal glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for spending some time with us today around the Word of God. We look forward to joining with you next time as we seek to let the Bible speak once again. For further information, visit our website at ltbs.tv.